Is qualified immunity still a valid defense for law enforcement and excessive force lawsuits? Today, I'm going to be talking about two recently released United States Supreme Court cases that address qualified immunity. What's up, everybody? I'm attorney Eric Scramlin, and this is the Tactical and Service Podcast, a podcast for law enforcement, where I go over training topics and case law to help you, the law enforcement community, stay up on the law. Today, I'm going to be talking about two recently released United States Supreme Court uh, decisions, both released on October 18th, 2021. They're both per curiam uh, opinions, so they weren't written by any particular justice, and they're they're fairly short opinions, but they deal with an important topic and a topic that uh, the law enforcement community is interested in knowing about. So I'm going to break down both of these cases today, and I'm going to give you the key takeaways of what you need to know from these cases. Before I get started, though, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, make sure you add us to the favorites, you know, whatever, uh, just add us because on this channel, I go over case law and uh, changes in the law to help you, the law enforcement community, stay up on the law. And uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about some of the courses that I teach, you can go to my website at tacticalattorney.com. I'll leave a link in the description down there below. All right, case number one, the first case I want to talk about today is City of Tahlequah versus Bond. And this case comes from the 10th Circuit, which is the circuit that covers where I'm at here in New Mexico. So this case has actually been on my radar for quite some time, and I was very happy to see uh, the Supreme Court take this case and issue an opinion on it. So what happened in City of Tahlequah versus Bond? Well, uh, it starts off as a 911 call, and I'm get, kind of giving you the Reader's Digest version here. By the way, I'm going to leave a link in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube so you can actually pull up the case and read it. Um, so in this case, uh, ex, ex-wife ex calls 911 and says that her ex-husband is at the house, he's intoxicated, and he's in the garage. He won't leave, and if police don't come, I think the quote was, things are going to get ugly real quick. So he didn't live at the residence. But the wife did say, the ex-wife did say um, to dispatch on the 911 call that he did keep some tools in the garage, which is where he was located. So officers get dispatched, and I it's hard to tell. I know there's at least two officers. It might have been three. Um, but the officers get dispatched, and they show up, and they make contact with the ex-wife, and she says, you know, he's in the garage. So the officers go out to the garage, and they stand kind of in the doorway, and they look into the garage, and he's in there. And at first it's conversational. So they're asking him, you know, like, what are you doing here? You you need to leave. He's uh, telling the officers, I'm not going to jail. I'm not going to jail. The officers are essentially telling them, like, you're not going to jail. You just, you need to go. And they offer to give him a ride home. This encounter happens pretty quickly. And at some point um, he makes clear that he's not listening to the officers. So he starts backing up in the garage and he's going towards a back wall. Where there's a bunch of tools hanging on the wall. The officers follow him and they go inside the garage. Suspect goes back towards the um, back of the wall and he appears to be, as the court set states in the opinion, he appears to be fidgeting with something and he appears to be nervous. And the officers start giving him commands. And then there's a body cam on this and uh, you can find it on YouTube. Just Google this case and it'll come up. But you see him fidgeting. He walks back and he reaches up and he grabs something off the wall. And then you can see when it comes into the body cam view that it's a hammer. And he's telling the officers, you know, I'm not going to jail. Get out of here. This is my house. Well, the officers then draw their guns. They pointed at him. They're telling him, drop the hammer, drop the hammer. At some point here, and this happens very quickly, the officer's about six to 10 feet away. And in the opinion, the court points out that there is an unobstructed path to the officers. So he holds the hammer and you can see in the body cam, he's holding it like a, like a baseball bat, but then he raises it back down. The officers have their guns drawn at this time. They're giving him commands to drop the hammer. And then he raises it. And the, I think that the opinion does a good job because I can see the imagery without even watching the video. He raises it like he's going to throw it or he's going to attack and he's got an unobstructed path. At that point, the officers discharge their weapons. Um, he's shot and he ends up passing away. 1983 lawsuit for excessive force follows. So the case goes district court where the district court um, grants qualified immunity and um, then of course they appeal and it goes to the 10th circuit and the 10th circuit court of appeals denies qualified immunity citing that there is established case law on the subject. They also state that the officers created uh, a reckless situation. So it gets to the Supreme Court. The question or the issue that was in front of the United States Supreme Court here was simply, were the officers entitled to qualified immunity? 
And the answer and the hold from the United States Supreme Court in this case was a yes. The Supreme Court overturned the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals and held that the officers were entitled to qualified immunity. The court, in reaching that decision, applied uh, well-settled principles of qualified immunity, and the court reiterates that and states it in the opinion. They talked about the fact that here, in this case, the officers didn't violate any clearly established case law. They talk about some stuff that the Court of Appeals relied on and how those cases were different, like substantially factually different than what... uh, what the circumstances and facts were in this case. And the court sort of reminds uh, the Court of Appeals that qualified immunity is an affirmative defense. When it's raised, it shields officers from civil liability as long as their conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. The court said that qualified immunity, and this is something the courts say a lot, and they repeated it, and it was refreshing to see this, qualified immunity protects all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. So what are the key takeaways here? What do you need to know about this very quick decision? Well, number one, I think you should realize as a law enforcement officer that qualified immunity is still a valid affirmative defense. When raised, it shields law enforcement officers from civil liability as long as officers are not violating clearly established case law. So in spite of you know what the media may portray, even politically, the courts are still relying on the doctrine of qualified immunity and they're applying it in their case law. So the law enforcement community, we need to understand the case law. We need to read the case law. We need to stay up to date on it. We need to apply those principles. That means you need to make it your job to really stay up to date on the the changes in the law. And you need to go back and you need to be familiar with those seminal cases, Graham versus Connor, Tennessee versus Garner understanding those factors from Graham versus Connor and how they apply. Uh, that, that's What's interesting here is that the court doesn't address the Fourth Amendment issue. They don't even go into whether or not this is excessive force. They don't address the Fourth Amendment at all. They just address the simple question of qualified immunity. But they do hint at some reminders that Graham versus Connor is a standard here, and they use things like objectively reasonable. Well, they say reasonable, but when we talk about Graham, we know we're talking about that objectively reasonable standard. We need to remember that. As I stress in my courses, with law as the law enforcement community, we need to make it our jobs, all right, to stay up to date on the law and to be professionals and really understand the law just like an attorney would. It's not enough to just have some general understanding. You really got to read these cases. You got to apply it. These are the principles, the playbook, the guidebook that we need to know that can save your life and protect our community's civil uh, liberties and civil rights. Okay, so the second takeaway that, you know, I kind of take here that I I sort of read in between the lines is, again, go home to Graham. Whenever we're talking about use of force cases, it is so important for every officer to have the Graham factors. You should be able to wake up in the middle of the night and spit them out. Graham factors, surf, severity, immediacy, resistance, flight. But the court reminds us, you know, these are kind of general factors. And for qualified immunity, you need to know that specific case law. And that's why the court granted qualified immunity here, because they found there was not any clearly established case law on this subject. So again, the key takeaways, make sure you're understanding your Graham factors. Make sure that uh, you're staying up to date on the law. And the court, qualified immunity applies here. They applied it. Like they always do, there are no changes. So I think that's important to know. Case number two, I'm just going to briefly talk about this one. It's 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 similar. This case is Daniel uh, Rivas Viegas versus Ramon Cortez Luna. This is a case out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, The facts uh, in this case a little bit different than the last case. This was a nine one one call where you had mom and two children that said they were barricaded in a room, and that boyfriend, you know, was drinking. He gets angry when he drinks, and he's trying to hurt them. The 911 dispatcher even says that she can hear a chainsaw in the background. So this is kind of an elevated situation for the officers. They respond. They knock on the door. Police, police, police. He comes out. They say that he's got some sort of tool in his hand. They order him to drop it. He drops it. He's initially cooperative with the officer's commands. He comes out of the house. But then the officers see that he's got a knife in his front pocket. And they, of course, they yell knife. Um, They give him commands, keep your hands up, which at first he does. But then he doesn't listen to the officer. He drops the hands and drops his head. When that happens, one of the officers shoots him with a beanbag shotgun. They get him to go down on the ground. The other officer, or it might have been the same one, I'm not sure from reading the case, but one of the officers comes in and puts a knee. If you have to read the case, it's like he straddles him, 
uh, right knee is sort of bent, left knee goes down into the back while he's taking that knife out. The court says in the opinion that this lasts approximately eight seconds, then he's handcuffed, and then the situation is done. He files a lawsuit under 1983, alleging excessive force under the Fourth Amendment. Again, uh, the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in this case denies qualified immunity, and the case goes to the United States Supreme Court where they're simply asked, were the officers entitled to qualified immunity here? And again, the United States Supreme Court said yes, overturning the Ninth Circuit. And a couple couple of takeaways from this case to focus on. Again, the court was just, just focusing on that qualified immunity aspect. Although in this case, they specifically mentioned Graham versus Connor. So again, the court specifically mentioning Graham versus Connor, even though they didn't go into that analysis, they're reminding us how important it is for every officer to know and understand those Graham factors. So again, go back to Graham versus Connor. Make sure you're buffed up on that stuff. Make sure you understand it. Severity, immediacy is a suspect resisting flight. And then don't forget about some of those other factors out there from cases that follow. You know, how many officers versus suspect? You know, what is the history of the defendant? All of these things kind of come into play. You need to stay up to date on that. So make sure you know those Graham factors. Make sure you're applying those. I cannot stress how important that is. In conclusion, from both of these cases, is qualified immunity still a valid defense? Absolutely. The Supreme Court, even in this brief per curiam opinion, applies the well-settled principles of qualified immunity, the importance of reminding you as a law enforcement, even though qualified immunity applied here, you have to stay up to date on the case law. As the court mentions, it applies to everyone except the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. You don't want to be that person that does that. So stay up to date on the case law. Know it. Go to training. Read it. Live it. Understand it. I got a link to both these decisions down there if you want to read them in their entirety. I hope this helps uh, shed some light on the two cases that were released and give you a little, a little bit of uh, some takeaways on what I think you need to know about that. So thank you for all you do, by the way, law enforcement community. It's been a while since I did a podcast, and I just want to remind you how grateful I am for what you do. And let me also mention, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down there. Love to have you join kind of the community here with the Tactical In Service. I'm, I try to get out these uh, podcasts whenever a new case comes up to help you stay up to date on the law. Also, if you're interested in learning about some of my more in-depth courses, don't forget to go to the website, tacticalattorney.com. Until next time, stay safe, everybody. Remember, every battle is won before it's fought. I'll see you on the next episode.